Um, so it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome back to a stage at, at, at an open group event um, somebody that uh, uh, some of you have seen before. He's uh, uh, as well as a great speaker, um, a personal friend, Mr. Ron Toledo, who is the uh, Executive Vice President and CTO, Master Architects, Insight and Data Global at Capgemini. And uh, as such, uh, he is a member of the Capgemini Group Techno uh, Chief Technology Innovation and Ventures Council, AI Futures Domain Lead. He's the lead author of Capgemini's Technovision Trend Series, which has been running for some years now, and editor-in-chief of Capgemini's Data Powered Innovation Review Series. And uh, in this presentation, Ron's going to take us through building on some of the latest insights from the Technovision trend publications, taking us down the rabbit hole of doing more with less, less with more, less with less, and even just saying no. So a warm welcome from the open group, please, for Ron Toledo. <laughs> welcome, sir. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much. You have very easy controls. On oh, look, yeah, yeah, green and red, I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Back and next, so it's, it's re relatively intuitive user experience. Look at that picture, 10 years old or something, but never, never mind that. So um, it's, this is a big room, uh, which also creates a bit of a distance somehow, but uh, hey, I'll, I'll try to overcome that so early on the morning on Monday. I've had worse presentations doing a keynote speech on Monday in Helsinki, Finland, for example, which is, uh, you know, sort of a silent audience typically. Uh, so I overcome that, so probably London would be, uh, would be pretty good to compare to that. But I do want to be vulnerable right from the start, because of a little bit among ourselves. I see a few familiar faces, so I want to be vulnerable right from the start here. Uh, I have to confess something. I have very few talents, if any. I'm a very untalented person, you know. Uh, some people know I used to be, uh, when I was young, uh, in the beginning of 20s, an uh, alternative rock band guitar player, and I wanted to have a career out of it. I was like, I saw myself on the biggest stages, you know, and I, I saw that coming, and that, that would be my career. And then it turned out I'm a very mediocre guitar player. And whatever I tried, you know, I've never become good, so, so it didn't work out. And later on, uh, I, I had this vision of uh, painting. I wanted to become a painter. There were famous Dutch painters like Carl Willink, um, some of you that are from the Netherlands, you may know him. And a famous painter had a very specific realistic style and I was very, you know, inspired by it. And, and I saw these, these, these 30s, 40s, 50s type of big paintings and then somebody in a yellow raincoat would be in these paintings suddenly. And that, that was the vision I had. And then you had the same problem. I tried to take a few painting lessons. Turned out I was highly untalented. Absolutely no talent to be a painter. So, so that beautiful vision of these paintings in my head, I could never surface, right? I could never instantiate. And then, of course, AI came. And uh, just, just, um, just a half an hour, half a year ago, I guess, we really got some, suddenly we got tools in our hands that enabled us to create things that we actually were maybe not talented for in the past. And now we were able to do it. So I used uh, one of the generative AI tools, Midjourney. Uh, may, some of you may know it quite well. Uh, there are others as well, like Stable Diffusion and Delhi, but I use Midjourney, so I use plain language to instruct the system to create a painting. And this one, I had this other vision of a guy on a moped uh, at the sea, which is a, a book by a famous Dutch writer, Moped at Sea, Bormer op Zee for the, for the Dutch people, Moped at Sea. And I combined these things, so, so this was one of the first I created. Uh, and it's sort of like a Moped at Sea, yellow raincoat, Carl Willink style painting. And so with very little talent, less, I, I have nothing, no talent at all, I'm still able to create something, I guess, interesting and valuable, at least in my eyes, right? Um, does that make sense? Does that make sense? It was difficult so early in the morning to make that connection to generative AI because nowadays I'm supposed to speak about sustainability, but every second email I get these days, every second speech I do nowadays, also with clients, it's, it's all about chat GPT and generative AI, so, so in hindsight, already a few months ago, I said, yes, we're going to present about innovation for, you know, for sustainability, and, and nowadays, I'm, I feel a little bit uncomfortable. What, no generative AI? Must be somewhere, there must be somewhere AI in it. So, hey, I'm glad I have it, at least at the beginning, and um, of course, it will not pop up any, anywhere else in my presentation, I guess. Although, maybe on this slide, yeah. Um, 
Um, always, always uh, describe your sources these days. This is an important thing in the, in the era of AI, which learns from sources, from data. Nowadays, we'll have to be very careful in terms of describing our sources. We have to explain and be transparent about what our sources are. So today, I'll tell, I'll tell you a few things that I've been uh, getting inspiration from, from Technovision, which is our company's yearly uh, techno trends uh, research. I'm, I'm very heavily involved in it, together with my fellow CTOs and architects, and, and every year we, uh, we release uh, 37 different technology trends and some main themes uh, across it. And when we had to make up the visuals last year, it was around September, mind you, quite some time ago, uh, we, we had some, uh, some friction with our marketing department, we couldn't figure out what to do with the front pictures and everything and the visual identity of the report. And then again, we said something like, well, you know, there's something new here coming up. It's relatively unexplored yet, mind you, September last year. Why don't we use generative AI for it? And in, in first instance, the marketing department was like, are you kidding? You know, we, we, we can't do this. This is completely ridiculous. AI could never do this. And then a week later, they came back and they said, I've seen the light. You know, I, I've seen a new universe. Uh, this was this moment of epiphany and, and it's completely life changing. And, and then they created the whole report, the visuals of it, uh, by AI. So no human was harmed. In, in the making of these visuals, right? As a disclaimer, no humans were harmed in the making of, this, uh, of the visuals here. But it's not only about the visuals, and mind you, the text this year was still generated by people, the actual text of the trends, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to say that this will be the case next year. Uh, there definitely will be some, some, some generative AI there involved as well. Uh, but, but there's, there's uh, some, some very interesting areas there in terms of us looking for um, what technologies can help us to create a more sustainable society, a more sustainable enterprise. And, and this is one of the, the main things as architects that we need to do. This is a conference that is focused on enterprise architecture. So from an architectural perspective, we need to make the right choices in terms of helping our enterprises and the society as a whole to make it more sustainable. So let me dive a little bit into it. Every report, every year as we release it, it also has a main theme. And, and, and this year, uh, we looked around a little bit, tried to predict, again, was September last year, we tried to predict what will the world look like in 23, um, which is difficult, but we did know for sure that given all the circumstances around us, scarcity of resources might be a very determining success factor. And this is not only in terms of uh, natural and human resources, but also in terms of energy, and nowadays, even cheap money. Uh, so, so we have to do it less, in a way, right? We have limited resources available. We can't simply use everything uh, that, that we used to uh, have available. So we need to be very uh, frugal about what we actually apply. And, and then, of course, we felt there's still a growing pressure on sustainability. So happy to see it's also the main theme of this conference. And I don't need to tell that or explain over here that there's no need to, to dive into it. But we did feel, combined with the scarcity of resources, sustainability is a, is a very crucial element that most of the businesses that we deal with um, act actually have a, have a focus on and, and are on a journey to establish that, whether, whether it's a net zero type of ambition or something else. Uh, every, I think every decent enterprise nowadays, of course, has its sustainability uh, targets and society expects it. Combine that, of course, with uncertainty. We call it uncertainty squared. Extremely difficult to predict. Uh, nowadays, I, I mean, not long ago, I had a, a company that literally wanted to create a five-year IT strategy. I was like, five weeks maybe, but, uh, you know, five-year IT strategy, literally. Extremely difficult to, to, to weave that together these days because it's so uncertain and, and we simply don't know, even in terms of economic outlooks. We, we see ourselves stand corrected every, every day, it seems, very difficult to predict. So, so if we work with technology, it needs to be sustainable, it needs to deal with scarcity of resources, it needs to help us to be resilient and agile and adaptive, right? So we, we need to be able to, to, to withstand whatever comes um, towards us. Uh, but whatever scenario pans out, it's very clear that technology is completely entwined in the equation. So this is very important. Every business is a technology business. It's good news for, for many of us that are involved in technology, because whatever scenario we're facing, whether it's sustainability at, at the heart of it or other objectives, we know that technology is fully entwined uh, in, in whatever we do, uh, which is interesting for architects, which is interesting for, for IT professionals, which is interesting for business professionals that need to become a bit of an architect and a bit of an IT expert themselves as well. 
So, so we, we put that all together, and then we came up originally with the theme for the report, which we called Less with Less. We thought that was a bit bold, because we all know less with more, for example, or more is less, or less, you know, we, we know all of these word plays, but not many people have done less with less. And we felt less, first of all, you want to create less CO2 emissions, you want to have a lighter footprint in what you create as an enterprise. We can use technology to do that. We want to tune that down a little bit in the way we use energy, for example, and so on. And we need to do it with less because there's scarcer resources. Uh, there, there's fewer energy available, fewer chips, fewer natural resources, and also people these days, very difficult to find. So, so how can we create a cleaner, lighter societal footprint combined with the fact that we have fewer resources available to do it? So, so we thought that, that sounds nice, less with less, with less, that's daring, that's bold, and then say marketing people, we bumped into them again and they said, are you, are you kidding? Okay, you, you got us with the generative AI, okay, fine. But we're not going to do this title because that's, you know, what will people say? They'll say, work with Capgemini and you get less for your money, you know? They were like that. We thought, well, it's, it's at least a challenging, provocative slogan, I guess. But so in the end, in the end, we had to back down there. We didn't win that one. Of course, today, my keynote speech is called Less with Less. So I had my way anyhow in the end. Uh, and it couldn't stop me here, but you, you get the point, right? Less with less is a very interesting one uh, b b because we, we, we need to tune down uh, what we're doing and enterprise architecture as architects. I, I think we're in the middle of that, of that change. So, so, so we, what, what does it actually mean? First of all, we want to use technology for positive futures. I think that's, that's clear. If we want to create a cleaner, more sustainable, more positive society and a more positive enterprise, we know that we can use technology, especially for these purposes. So if we make choices for a technology, we know we have to choose these technologies that help us to create a more positive future or the, or the type of futures uh, that, that, that enterprises are looking for. But on the other hand, technology itself has a large footprint because it demands energy itself. Uh, I'll be back on that a little bit uh, in, a, in a few minutes. For example, all of these brilliant AI models, the mid-journeys, the chat GPTs uh, of this world, they are all very, very hungry for energy and they need a lot of chips uh, to, much to the liking, by the way, of the, the current chips uh, manufacturers. So, so it's, it's actually coming with a s significant sustainability impact itself as well. Also, because we have scarcity of people and scarcity of resources, we need to create a smarter, leaner portfolio. So we can't do like we used to do, right? Let a thousand flowers bloom. Also, as architects, let's create a portfolio. Let's try a lot of different things and see what works. And maybe now with the scarcity of the thing and the environmental impact, we need to be a little bit smarter than that. We cannot no longer, I think, um, do that. Just, we cannot afford ourselves to, to actually do whatever we want to try in these good old days and see what, what works and what doesn't, right? And, and it also means because we don't have everything uh, available these days to build it from nil, we have to upcycle much more as well. All of that is sort of illustrated with less with less, right? Leaner, lighter portfolio. Uh, things that have lower emissions and have less impact on the environment and will have to do it with fewer resources, right? So, so that's a bit, if I only had these, these 10 minutes, uh, Steve, then, then this, this would have been it. But uh, I, feel, I see I have a little bit more, so uh, I'll go a little bit further and let me dive a little bit into that. Um, so, so in the end, this is the, uh, the, the, the sort of compromise that we got from marketing. So this was the slogan of the report in the end, write the technology, write the future. So writing means, first of all, making the right choices, select the, the, the right ones, the things that do good, but also are smart in terms of if we have limited availability of resources, uh, we have to make the right choices, uh, but also things that are good, so they're good for society. And, and then, of course, um, we also need to right-size the thing. So writing as a verb, um, in term, instead of an adjective, is, is also important over here. We want to right size. We want to understand the impact of the technology choice we make versus the, the value that it creates also in terms of sustainability. So you're writing. I like that as a verb. I, don't, I wouldn't use that much, but it's apparently correct English. Uh, so, so we're writing something as well. And uh, so, so that's a nice wordplay. And if you do that all right, then, then you can write <laughs> the future that you want, right, which is simply, well, okay, we have objectives, technology is an integral part of it. If, if, we, if we write the technology, we can write that future, right? we can create 
uh, these type of futures. Well, enough said about that. Let's look a little bit at technology for positive futures. I'm sure you'll see this picture a few times pop up, hopefully today. Some of you may recognize it. I used it half a year ago in good old Edinburgh as well. I'm upcycling myself a tiny little bit. Two or three slides that I used half a year ago. I'm sure most of you have been trying to forget it anyway, but uh, this was half a year ago in Edinburgh when I did a presentation, which you could see a little bit as a precursor as a precursor to this uh, particular topic. But if we look at these uh, 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations, you could say, and I thought a little bit in the uh, introduction for the program as well, that, that the 17th one, right, and, and creating partnerships and ecosystems and platforms actually is up to, let's say, technology and, and the type of business that we're in. But, but I believe that actually all of these 17 sustainable development goals, and we've done that exercise a lot ourselves, actually are enabled by, by technology. Each and every one of them is, is actually a, a technology business type of uh, challenge. And if we choose the right technologies, we can actually enable and support each and every of these 17 very important uh, sustainable development goals. And by the way, if we're talking about sustainability, I always feel I, I, I tend to look indeed more at these SDGs rather than sustainability in the narrow sense of the word. You know, uh, less CO2, um, which I understand. And we need to bring back th that footprint, but there's much more. So if we're talking about sustainable development goals, I like that context for, for looking at technology uh, much more. Um, and we have a lot of interesting examples of it. Uh, just, just a few things that I've been involved in myself and that I'm, I'm pretty proud of. Uh, we, we used to have already a few years ago uh, quite an award-winning project that we did uh, with some of our best AI and data people, which was called uh, Project Farm. Uh, used to do it in, uh, started it in, in Africa, particularly Kenya. Later on uh, also implemented this uh, throughout uh, rural uh, India. And the whole idea is using lightweight technology, so not everybody has a fancy iPhone 14 over there to their availability. Using very lightweight technology still enable farmers uh, to, to actually make the right choices in terms of their crops, when they want to harvest things, uh, the seeds they want to use, um, how they want to distribute it, uh, what markets they could connect to, in order to do something about food shortages and, and have more farmers have a, a decent life, right? So resolve global food shortages through AI, through sensors, through satellite images, through data exchange, but then make it available through very lightweight technology, because you can't everywhere in rural India, you know, have that, have that typical, let's say, communication availability that we're used to. Um, not so long ago, we did uh, with the LOVA Institute, which is the Lofoten uh, Environmental Institute for the ocean there, and, and there we use a lot of sensor data uh, about the movements uh, going on um, uh, underneath in the waters to better understand um, what's happening over there so, so that we can, uh, you know, learn from it and, and create a more sustainable ocean as well. So that's an interesting one in which we used a lot of sensor data again. So not, in this case, not necessarily satellite data, but there are so many different sensors in the ocean over there. And, and we applied, again, machine learning. These were hackathons, by the way, so, so they're global data science challenges. And, uh, and recently, we did Code for a Cure, a uh, very important one. You have the, this disease, river blindness, in Africa. Um, and, uh, millions and millions of people um, contracted every year. Uh, very difficult to understand the, the, the right antibiotics treatment that you need for it. And, and by using, um, again, um, image recognition, uh, you see all the different strains of, of this uh, particular disease and understand better, uh, very quickly be able to do a local diagnosis and have exactly the right uh, medicine a combination for a specific individual case. And it turns out that it's extremely effective uh, if you use AI and, and data for that. There are just a few examples. Next one, I can already announce it over here, will be around biodiversity. Um, and particularly in terms of insects, uh, which are so crucial, of course, to, to a sustainable planet and understanding their behaviors, their populations, um, their, their uh, locations. Um, again, with, with a lot of data sets available around that that nobody's really leveraging, uh, we expect that to, to be an important one as well. So, so you see, if we're talking about sustainability, and we'll have a lot of CO2 discussions, no doubt, in these days, but, but I think if we look at sustainability, it's a bigger thing, right? And, and it's, it's all around us. And in any case, we see technology being such an important part of it. Um, now, I, I, 
I think the, the biggest challenge for many architects seems to be to, to making these right choices. So, so if we have all of these different technology enablers, all of these different innovations and trends, which one should we choose in order to reach our, our sustainable development goals, right? Um, if you dive into TechnoVision, some of you may know it. Uh, you, you may want to uh, find it yourself, technovision.capgemini.com. It's, it's free for everybody, it's open, it's public, always has been. Uh, but you'll find 37 different trends in it. Uh, in infrastructure and in applications, in data, in process automation, in collaboration tools, in user experience. So there's, there's lots of different technologies over there. Um, and I, I would claim, and I have found that sometimes we do that little innovation exercise. We do it with a card deck, so we have these 37 trends also on a card deck. And you just pick a random card, literally pick a card, any card, and, and, and you are sort of you know, trying to find a, a sustainable application of it for, for the challenge at hand. And, and there's very few technology trends that you couldn't be leveraging to, uh, to reach these sustainable goals. Um, now, well, 37, I negotiated with Steve and the team. That, that would take me two and a half hours here to discuss all of them. So in the end, it turned out that was not really um, an option. So, so I choose a few that, that I think are, uh, are particularly uh, interesting uh, nowadays because they are sort of, sort of signifying what we're currently seeing around us. All of these are, by the way, modern trends. Uh, but, but I believe there's a few that are particularly interesting uh, right now that all of us, particularly also as architects, need to be aware of in order to choose the right uh, technologies. If you, by the way, are wondering about uh, the names over there, th this is a thing we do already for many years. Some of you know TechnoVision. We like to do some decent neuro-linguistic programming, NLP. So we're using uh, references to rock and pop and soul and movies and culture and art so that people remind, uh, remember things better and people like to simply engage in it. If you have a card deck, and a playful card deck with, with, you know, sort of compelling trend names, we try to be compelling, it sort of um, inspires both business, but also, uh, I don't think my time is up, by the way, but, but this is... <laughs> now you have to wake up, right? That's, uh, that's, that's, oh, there we go again. Yeah, okay, well. This venue has it all, you see? We, we can do these, these light uh, scenes. No, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's sort of fun. Uh, for example, edge computing, we, we could tell an audience, business and IT people, about all the virtues of edge computing, and then they're at home, at the end of the workshop, they're, they're back at home, and, and they might forget, unless we, we use the song Simply the, the, the Best, right, Tina Turner, and, and we call the trend Simply the Edge, and, and sort of stays in the, in the brain. That, that's a little bit what we've been doing. So you shouldn't think, what are they, are they crazy or something? This is actually very serious. We apply this on a daily basis. We work around the world in innovation workshops using card decks and, and cardboard boxes with these 37 trends on it and, and find very playful scenarios. Um, and, and almost in, in all cases, if we're looking for a sustainability objective that we want to achieve, you would pick any of these 37 trends. You would study it. What is it? What does it mean? Maybe scan the QR code, know a little bit more about it, and then you probably would find some unexpected idea on how to apply that technology to achieve that, that sustainability goal. But I, I just chose a few that I thought were particularly uh, re um, relevant right now. Um, so, so first of all, of course, uh, as I said, simply the edge. Uh, edge computing obviously sensors. A lot of the sustainability um, uh, journeys we currently see are based on the use of uh, sensor technology. Edge computing is not only uh, collecting data, which I find very important to say, it's not only about collecting the data, it's about putting it into practice and actually using it also at the edge through edge computing and actually put it into maybe autonomous actions. Uh, so, so edge computing, simply the edge, is a, is a very important one. Uh, nowadays, uh, there is uh, some AI stuff happening. Did I mention that already? Maybe I did. There is some AI, very fascinating AI stuff currently happening. And the thing is, everybody can use it. I have neighbors, they're 76, 78. They actually have an opinion about ChatGPT currently, literally. Uh, so everybody, by the way, has an opinion now about ChatGPT. You're nowadays on LinkedIn. Again, every second post is about, I have a perspective on ChatGPT, right? And this is my, uh, this is my perspective on it. And usually it's co-written by ChatGPT these days. Eh? And, and it's, sort of, sort of, it's, it's a sort of ironic feedback loop going on here. Uh, but, but anyway, it is very much available now. And whether it's text to image, whether it's uh, the language model to create better text, whether it's um, anything else you want to create or generate, and now a simple web service, a simple API call is already enough to embed it in whatever applications you already might have. 
And then it suddenly becomes much smarter, it becomes more generative, it suddenly becomes AI enabled. And I think in terms of upcycling, it's not always a matter of building new applications. Sometimes it's just a matter of looking at an existing application portfolio and ask yourself, what if I would add a, a touch of AI love to it? And, and would that already do the job for me in terms of upcycling rather than building an entirely new application from scratch with all of its environmental impacts potentially as well? So, so apps love AI is, is one of the most important ones and nowadays so relevant because it's so easy for all of us. Uh, without having to be a, a data scientist to, to add that power, that generative power to existing applications. Um, of course, there's a notion of the, uh, what we call the Internet of Twins, which is not the Internet of Things, but if we're able, for example, in, in, in big asset-rich environments in which we often have these assets, uh, these, these sustainability uh, objectives, of course, if we're able to really create a, a Internet of Twins and maybe support that by, what was it again, the metaverse? You know, it's sort of a far cry currently, but it probably will come back. And what we see is particularly in uh, what we call intelligent industry, so in manufacturing or, or asset-heavy environments like an oil platform in the sea or whatever, if, if you create there, first of all, that digital twin, we all know what that is, right? Because through sensors and everything, we're able to create a digital model of something physical in the outside world. And then you combine it with virtual or auto augmented reality, you, you get that internet of twins that, that sooner or later might help us to reach our sustainability goals. Because as, as we know, the, the combination of sensors and the ability to collect data and then process it and use it for all sorts of different analytical purposes, to turn it into action, I think is, uh, is one of the most important things. Uh, touchless experiences in which you create uh, self-driving processes, processes that optimize themselves, that don't need human intervention, fewer people to travel, fewer people to have there be at physical locations, uh, optimizing their usage of energy, for example, or any other type of sustainability indicator we have is a very interesting one. It's still one of my favorite trends, by the way, can't touch this. I mean, it's obvious where that comes from, I hope, no? Can't touch this, I mean, come on. I, I, given the average audience age, I would say, yeah, pretty good chance. Yeah, exactly, so, so MC Hammer, of course, and if you don't know MC Hammer, look him up at YouTube and it will change your life. Uh, this is my prediction, really, or at least your dance, or at least your dance routines might, might be uh, influenced by it. Um, we have the notion of what we call net zero data. Um, and because, of course, if, if, and, and, and today and, and tomorrow, the Open Footprint Forum, for example, and so many other things we're doing, it, it all seems to resolve in the end around data. Um, so so um, creating a, a next level maturity in terms of data management and, and the way you, you uh, collect data, it's now suddenly become a, a new journey. Where, where in the past, uh, we, we used to say we want to become a data-driven organization. It's nice, you know. We have better metrics, better performing organization. Everybody look warm enthusiasm for it. But now we realize we want to achieve these very important sustainability objectives. And we realize that we need data for it. Data is pivotal to, uh, to achieving that. Um, so uh, net zero data. Um, and by the way, also understanding that data itself is, is a source of waste is, is an important one there. Um, and, and finally, what we call your mesh for lash, uh, creating uh, ad hoc collaborative ecosystems of, of companies and, and actors playing and working together to reach their sustainability objectives and do it on a very, let's say, agile basis. Remember, it's uncertainty squared. You don't know who you have to work with together to reach your sustainability objectives and create that lightly coupled, uh, lightweight mesh of, of actors uh, is very much technology enabled as well. Maybe you could even use blockchain for it, who knows? Uh, it's still very big aspirin and looking for a headache, I guess, uh, blockchain, but, but sooner or later, together with metaverse, it might find its way. It's just so compelling and so overwhelming that, that this generative AI thing, which we saw already coming for a few years, but didn't really sort of embrace. And then within weeks, literally, nowadays we're looking at new announcements on a daily basis rather, rather than anything else, right? So it's sort of, sort of remarkable. I haven't seen it often in my relatively long career by now and haven't seen often these type of inflection points coming so soon and, and being so overwhelming. So um, what I want to uh, finish with a little bit is, is uh, a few words for, for us as architects. Oh, this is generative AI, by the way. I use this. I asked 
uh, mid-journey, what would the first female CEO of Capgemini look like? It's a French company, so, so I thought there must be a chateau somewhere in the background, and this is what she looks like, apparently. I, I, I thought, you know, yeah, that, that's sort of credible, I guess, somehow, probably. We actually have a, have a CFO, Carol Ferrand, that looks like her for some reason, so who knows? Um, but, but I actually used it for another uh, presentation in which I was talking about drinking our own champagne. And drinking our own champagne means, we're a French company, eh, by the way, so we're not eating our own dog food. That's, that's not classy. Uh, right? So we, we, we always say we drink our own champagne. That sounds so much better, agreed? So much better, we drink our own champagne. And, and uh, this is all about if we as IT people or architects or, or strategists are, are saying to the business, this is what you need to embrace in order to become more sustainable. Ourselves, we need to be more sustainable as well. It's a key message I had uh, in Edinburgh as well, so I will not really dive into it today, but it is important. Uh, talking about sources, we have another research report which you can easily find. Capgemini Research Institute, it's called Sustainable IT. And it makes this claim in terms of, well, if we look at IT, it can be used for so many different sustainability purposes, but let's not forget that on the other hand, uh, it also has its own substantial environmental footprint as well. So, so um, you know, in terms of e-waste, in, in terms of CO2 emissions, uh, we simply have to do with less. Uh, and this is a very important one. And now, of course, since Edinburgh, I, I didn't have these measures available, but suddenly, of course, we, we see the new thing, machine learning models suddenly begin to get their impacts. Because we love AI, we're all maybe using ChatGPT or Midjourney or Stable Diffusion. Or, or um, any of the other large language models that will come on the market in the forthcoming days and weeks. I, I wouldn't even say months, but, but they'll all be available. And they all burn a lot of energy in order to establish it, particularly GPT-3. I'm not even talking here about GPT-4, the successor to, to, to the, 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 the biggest right now, the most important large language um, AI model. Uh, you know, it, uh, it really likes to, uh, to burn a lot of energy. Um, so, so this is in for, for architects from an architectural perspective in which we always try to find the balance. Uh, we, we realize that AI and data can indeed be used for a whole you know, wide range of issues, right? And, and we, we, we realize this. And I tried to make the point at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, it's obvious that, that we can do that. We see all the SDGs, right? All the 17 sustainable uh, development goals. We can, all, we can all pick it up. Uh, and by the way, if, you, if you're a relatively young person who wants to join a company and you're using technology for that, it's, you, you, you would prefer to work for an organization that applies all of that. But on the other hand, uh, we realize that, uh, that uh, well, as I said, there, there's a big environmental impact that comes with it as well. And particularly AI, truly, the way I see it, is a balance act. We, we, need to, we need to find that balance in terms of this is the impact that we achieve with it versus this is the harm we do to the environment uh, because these AI models really are hungry for energy. And obviously chip manufacturers like NVIDIA, they're, they're working on creating chipsets for that machine learning particularly. It's not using the, the, the inference model, it's more like the, the machine learning, training the model, and, and they're trying to find uh, more energy, uh, you know, saving um, hardware for it as well. But that will, that will take some time. So this is very much about striking the right uh, balance, right? Um, so that's an important one. This is not generated, this is a real picture. Um, but that's the final thing I wanted to say to you is, so here we are, we were choosing the right technologies. We're inspired by all these different technologies. And, and again, whatever technology as a card you might pick, probably you find a way to use it to create a more sustainable uh, world and a more sustainable enterprise. Um, so this is all brilliant. We made the right choices and they are sensible and, and they do justice. To, to being uh, frugal with, with all the resources, so we've done it all. And then, of course, you have a plan. And then Mike Tyson, as a boxer, always said, well, you know, you, you, everyone has a plan un until you get punched in the face, right, or in the mouth. Um, so so that's, that's a bit of a problem. Now you're in the boxing ring, and why doesn't it work? Why doesn't it happen? And I think as we are having an EAR, you know, an enterprise architecture conference here today, I did feel I could finalize a little bit with some findings uh, a few additional sources that you may fancy. At the end of the day, you have this urge to download things because, oh man, you know, here, here I have a few tips for you, additional tips. But they also contain some very valuable lessons that I think as architects, from an architectural perspective, if you like, uh, can be strategists or 
consultant or a project manager as well, but we need, to, we need to address these in order to actually be successful rather than just having a plan, but, but actually be able to do it and, and actually succeed. So the first report, which, which I really would recommend to you, is called uh, A World in Balance. And, and uh, we found in that research, which we've done very recently, that uh, most of the companies we surveyed uh, have uh, their ambitions, you know, they, they want to become more sustainable, they have very clear metrics, not really translating it into action currently. There's not that much really going on in terms of that's, that's compelling, that's inspiring, that's, uh, they're achieving something. And, and we found a little bit that, that there's a few companies that do it, and everybody might be inclined to focus a lot on the tech accelerators on the right, so as I did in the beginning of my pitch, because it's early on Monday morning and we want to see some juicy technology, so I, uh, I introduced a few to, to you that, that might be interesting. But, um, you know, uh, we, we, need, we need the right processes, of course, and we need to understand the entire value chain. And I think it's not only a matter of having data there and collect it and then monitor it and report about it. I think that's a big mistake. And, and I think, for example, the Open Footprint Forum will focus more and more also in putting that data into actions rather than in reports and dashboards only, which are crucial, it's the first step. But you want to understand uh, the full scope of the value chain and, and then understand where you actually will apply uh, throughout that value chain your, your sustainability uh, actions and, and data points. Uh, but the most important one, I guess, is in the middle and it's always the same. If this is only uh, you know, a little IT team or a little digital transformation team or a little uh, um, chief sustainability officer type of team, uh, you won't get that organization to move. So, so in the middle, there, there is this cultural shift, this understanding that's an integral part of what you are in the company. And, and I think that is one of the, the main areas for an architect to be involved in as well, to understand that part of the equation, the change, rather, rather than just the choices, which are nice, and, and the diagrams, and uh, you know, all of that is great, but in the end, this is what it comes down to. And it's the same for, with data for net zero. I, I just showed you that trend. A uh, lot of companies that want to achieve something in terms of sustainability, they go for, uh, for data because they you know, realize data is at the heart of actually achieving that, that ambition. But then again, we, we found that a lot of organizations currently simply embark on that, so they start to collect data. And should we do anything about it except the man mandatory reporting currently? No, they don't. And, and as I said, I, I feel that that's one of the biggest challenges we currently have is we, we start to, to collect uh, these data points. It doesn't mean that we actually put it into algorithms, actions maybe, uh, AI, uh, autonomous systems, uh, automatic decision points, um, optimizing systems that optimize themselves. I, I think all of that uh, still needs to be achieved and, and we found at least that, that there's very few organizations that actually fully embrace that thought already. And again, as architects, I, I think that's, that's the type of change you want to achieve and that, that you want to build in into your uh, processes. And then finally, um, the whole notion of circular economy, because we have limited resources, we have to do more with what we have. If we do it, uh, we need to make it ready for a next iteration, incarnation, if you like, um, of its life. So circular economy is, is very crucial. We realize that, again, technology and data is very much at the heart of it. But again, we found that, yes, you need to leverage technology and data at the very center of all of these different things you can do to create a more circular, more sustainable business. Uh, but, but again, collaboration, so, so being able to reach out to, to many different players in, in your own value chain and far outside it, because this is a scope-free plus type of uh, challenge. And then again, have the organizational enablers and the organizational shifts to actually achieve it is, uh, is crucial over there. So these are a few, if, if you look at these big reports and why it's not happening, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit maybe controversial in my speech to talk a lot about technology, but in the end, if we've done the right thing and we chose the right technology, it doesn't mean uh, that, that um, we're actually there. Um, I'll, I'll shift this one, uh, skip this one a little bit for the sake of time, but it, it's an important design principle that, that I would like to emphasize. That, that, that we teach our architects a lot these days, which is called do good, do less, do well. And I think you sort of get it, right? This, this is all about, first of all, doing the right things in terms of its impact on society. So you only do the, the good things uh, with your, with your um, technology solutions and your architectural decisions. Then you want to restrict yourself, you want to be frugal, 
you want to think in terms of maybe I could have a leaner, smarter portfolio with lightweight technologies, and I do it with fewer resources. And if you do all of that right, we would say nowadays you're creating your future, you're looking for, but you simply could say you do well. Um, um, and, and it's sort of a play, of course, on, on a famous saying, but do good, do less, do well, is, is really what it comes down to. And I think it's an architectural principle, it's a guiding principle that we could be applying to the portfolio of our activities and our architectures and our, the choices uh, that we've made. So that's really what I wanted to tell you, but then again, of course, I couldn't help myself to do one sim final little thing with, 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 with generative AI. This might be the title of a new uh, trend that we have in 24, so I'm giving you some sort of a preview here. I think we will call it my AI generation, if you don't know where that comes from, uh, but uh, I think you do, right? My AI generation probably will be a new one in which we see this augmentation be between the consultant, the architect, the strategist, the, pro the project manager, the CEO, versus that augmentation AI, a the augmentation that AI brings to us, whether it's ChatGPT, um, or, or any other powerful, creative, large language model that we will have available in the forthcoming weeks and months to help us do our work. And I think one of the themes for the next Open Group Conference, uh, um, Patty, might, might be, uh, you know, the augmented architect, how we're going to use AI to do our work as architects and consultants uh, in an augmented way, because if our neighbors are doing it, 76, 78, then maybe... You know, maybe as, as architects uh, in, in our full career, we should be uh, considering that as well. So there's a lot going on currently in the architects community in terms of what will be the impact of, of AI on, on, on the skill of, of being an architect. We used to think that is so, that is so creative, that is so high level, uh, you know, top quality work. AI will never do that. It will automate, a, you know, um, some, somewhere there in, in the supply chain. But our work as architects, of course not. Oh, I, I, I beg to differ by now. I, I think it's, uh, it's clear that it might look differently. This one, of course, is also generated, uh, as you will appreciate. No, but I, I just asked, just before I went to the Open Group Conference, I simply asked it, hey, how can technology create a more sustainable enterprise? And I got a pretty reasonable 80% type of answer that I could use to build on myself. And I used it as a checklist to see, well, the trends that I'm showing in the first part of my pitch, are they actually covered by this? And I think it's pretty reasonable what it came up with. Um, and, and it's just, you know, little, little first architectural foundational piece of text that you could be working on. I thought it was pretty solid. And uh, there's no hallucinations over there or fake text or anything like that. It's actually pretty, pretty useful. So thank you very much, ChatGPT over there. You try it yourself as well. So that's really uh, what I wanted uh, to tell you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, be sustainable. And uh, do good, do less, do well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Um, you can take a seat. Oh, I can take a seat. That's, that's brilliant. A couple of questions. Wow. Oh, I think I've... I'm not sure if I'm live or not. I am. Good. Uh, I Thank look you. like I need a chair, right? Yes. Will be quick. yes, whichever chair you like. Well, uh, we don't have to uh, <laughs> cram in, do we? We can sit. No, here. no, this is good. No, great stuff. Thought for you, you actually answered the first two questions um, already ah. in, your, in, your, uh, in your presentation. So um, let's go with uh, which of the 17 sustainability initiatives do you see progressing the most in terms of reaching their goals? In reaching their goals. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm qualified enough to say about that. Obviously, there is a lot on, on the, let's say, core sustainability areas, like, like clean water, you know, clean air. Uh, I, I think there, there's a lot of focus on that one. Um, I, I'd like to see a, a few more human-oriented uh, SDGs be, be emphasized on as well. So, so, uh, but, but I wouldn't call myself qualified to see which one is progressing the most. Uh, right. Right. Uh, I hope all of them, frankly. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a chart that we see in in different presentations for different reasons. And yeah. so I think people are looking at it from different angles. But um, you, you closed with talking about how technology, um, the impact that te technology can have. But this, uh, is, as you've said several times, is a, um, a theme of uh, EA for sustainability. So the question has yeah. come in, how can enterprise architecture facilitate the measurement and reporting of sustainability metrics to track progress and communicate sustainability performance? Well, it, it is pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the aim of, of becoming more data-driven enterprise, right? Uh, data-powered enterprise. 
So I like that because I have a data background these days. Uh, so, so, so as part of the architectural effort, we, we realize that, that becoming more data powered is suddenly at the core of what we're doing, right? And, and then again, it, it, we realize it's not only about collecting data, which is very foundational. S some people stick even with the platforms. What shall we take? Uh, Google, Microsoft, Azure, uh, whatever, um, Snowflake. And, and it, it's very technically driven in terms of we need a next generation cloud data platform. Uh, so, so it's already more advanced if you realize what are actually the data points that we want to collect at what places and, and how do we want to make them available for reporting, as was said over here, measuring progress. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I prefer to think for the architects, the more important th is, is at the other side of the equation, which is getting the people to actually embrace data in their daily activities and, and, and realize that, that the sustainability quest is also theirs and, and that the data is there to help them achieve it. Um, rather, rather than this, this reporting thing that we currently see with a lot of organizations. Okay, we have the reporting so we can put it in our yearly you know, uh, report or anything like that. So, so I think understanding how it's embedded in, in our daily lives as data, which always has been the quest around data, by the way. Uh, but nowadays with the sustainability targets are so, so, so pressing, I think so important uh, that people realize there's no alternative. We have to do this. Because how could you measure progress in your sustainability objectives if you don't have the data for it? So to make that a little bit more central to the whole journey, the architectural journey, I think I like that as an idea. And it's the, the, the key focus for the, uh, the open, group, open Footprint Forum that you well, mentioned a couple of times, yeah. is getting that data model uh, worked. worked bring, it alive, the, uh, bring, bring it alive. Bring it to life, make that, it that real. That will be uh, the, um, the next step, I guess. Uh, so we'll have to just make it one last question. Um, COP26 and IT data center power consumption. You, you did touch on this um, in your presentation, but um, and and IT's desire to sell more stuff aren't aligned. No. Um, what's the right answer, do you think, to support climate temperature goals? In terms of um, the the well, the fact that there's the. I think he wants to sell more, is that it? Well, the, 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 what you mentioned about the consumption of power and energy hungry and all of these things versus... Um, well, precisely. Uh, yeah, and, IT, and, and of course, IT's desire to sell more of that stuff. Um, but how does that have the... Uh, what's the right answer to support uh, climate temperature goals? I mean, it used to be stuff like what's, what's the return on investment, right? Or, or even what is the total cost of ownership of this particular IT initiative? And nowadays, I would say, what, what is the, let's say, total societal impact of it as an indicator is something as an IT person you need to convincingly communicate as well as being positive. Uh, and, and I think that's relatively new to IT people because I, I think you're right, whoever asked the question, IT people just want to do more. And, and we, we did say uh, somewhere, um, as a design principle, just say no, which apparently in the US, by the way, is a sensitive thing to say, but to just say no is, is apparently something else. But uh, hey, we're, we were in Europe at the time when we made it up. Uh, but, but, but the thing is, it's IT, and, and that is very unnatural to IT people to say, well, maybe we shouldn't do this one because it has a negative total societal impact. Uh, so it's nice that we solve a few issues with it, but it comes with a cost that's even higher. Uh, so I don't think we should do it, uh, which is relatively new to IT people that used to say, gave us your requirements and, and your specifications and, and we'll make a, a long list and short list of it and, and we'll execute on all of them. And nowadays it would be nice to say, well, no, we can only do a few and, and, and we'll have to be very smart and, and informed uh, about it. I, I think we all get better as a result of it. Well, congratulations on getting uh, less with less, less past, with less. past the marketing department. Well, the, I didn't get it past the marketing department, <laughs> but at least I got it past the open group. You, you did get it past, yeah. I remember one of my uh, one of my favourite taglines from the from the past was uh, Stella Artois had a had a tagline the, the beer, uh, reassuringly expensive. Reassuringly which expensive, which must have been quite an interesting one to get by as well. But Maybe you can use it next year. Right? Yeah, possibly, <laughs> possibly. Ron Toledo, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Steve. Great job, thank you.